Good morning, everyone. Uh, delighted to be here. My name is Katrin Schulteis. I'm an associate professor in the history department. Very happy to be uh, here for this session, welcoming uh, Dr. Katerina Ruban to uh, speak to us about her research. Dr. Katerina Ruban is a Ukrainian historian who specializes in Soviet and Ukrainian history with an emphasis on women's history and the history of abortion. In September 2022, she received a PhD from New York University. Before coming to the United States, Katerina was part of the Visual Culture Research Center in Kyiv. As a junior visiting fellow at, um, the, at, the, at this center at IRA, she will focus on turning her dissertation on abortion in the USSR into a book. She will also continue her research on how Russian academia presents the war in Ukraine and its role in this war for the Western audience. Today, she's going to talk to us about her dissertation and her research, and, and the talk is entitled Female Emancipation in Doctors' Hands, OBGYN Nina Halapachuk, and the history of abortion in the USSR. So she's going to talk a little bit about her work, and then we will turn the session over to some uh, questions and answers. Katerina? Uh, thank you, uh, Katrin, for introduction. And uh, thank you all for being here personally and virtually. Um, so when I started uh, my PhD program at New York University, I was not interested in Soviet medicine, uh, but I uh, was very excited about Michel Foucault uh, and I still love his work. Uh, so um, uh, I wanted to say something uh, new about Soviet state and Soviet women. So uh, hospital and maternity was an obvious choice. And at the same time, um, I found the manuscript of a memoir written by Nina Holopatyuk uh, an obstetrician gynecologist who worked in uh, Soviet uh, uh, medicine for almost 40 years. And the manuscript is a fascinating source. It depicts her private and personal life in the late uh, 40s and uh, uh, until the early 60s. Uh, and it, it was a starting point for my dissertation project. Um, but initially abortion was not a priority. I wanted to write a, a, a micro history, a history of a hospital as an institution. Uh, and then I came to realize that uh, abortion is such an uh, access uh, that allows me to see and tell something about the uh, Soviet state and Soviet women. So the core of my dissertation is uh, microhistory uh, of Nina and uh, the hospital. And this microhistory develops on a large uh, background that I was able to see working in the uh, archive of the uh, of the town where Nina uh, lived and in the regional archive and also in the uh, archives of the Ministry of Public Health of Soviet Ukraine in Kyiv. Uh, abortion actually in the Soviet Union um, uh, have been studied already, but mostly from the perspective of central archives. Uh, so what we know about Soviet women and uh, Soviet gender politics is mostly based on life in Russia and what scholars uh, can find in Moscow archives. So I did the opposite. I turned to small town women and doctors in Soviet Ukraine, uh, and not just in so uh, it's a particular part of Soviet Ukraine on the border of Hungary and Slovakia. Uh, and I was finishing uh, my dissertation this spring uh, with the war raging at home. Um, and uh, now um, Ukraine uh, is still destroyed, and unfortunately I cannot do anything about it. The only thing I can do is just write about Ukraine, and uh, the only thing I can do is to fight the dominance of Russian studies and narratives that they My goal is to change the perception of, uh, of the Soviet as Russian. Uh, it's also very important for me to uh, turn my dissertation into a book at this moment now uh, because, of, uh, because of what is going on here in the US. Uh, and I think my work can be useful for understanding um, the different ways of politicizing and the current politics. So the main argument of my book um, is that the Soviet Union was not pronatalist just because it banned abortion in uh, 1936, and it's similar to the U.S. states that are not pronatalist because now they 
And abortion was a part of female emancipation in the Soviet Union uh, because doctors uh, considered abortion a part of female emancipation. It was a part of social changes and at the same part, uh, uh, it justified desire of women to regulate their reproduction. Uh, and I look uh, at abortion through the larger history of Soviet public health care. The Soviet public health care uh, was imagined and supposed to be uh, standardized and unified one where all the decisions were dictated from above. Uh, but at the same time, abortion for doctors continued to be a matter of their professional autonomy during the entire Soviet period. Uh, and actually, I'm going to start with the pre-Soviet period and look at the pre-revolutionary doctors who were the first one who politicized abortion. Abortion was nothing new in the early 20th century. Uh, but it was not doctors, but midwives in Ukraine and Russian, it's babka, babka in plural, who performed the procedure. And it was not just in rural areas, but also in uh, big cities. And at that time, doctors started to promote the surgical method of abortion as the only safe abortion, in contrast to babka's methods like herbs and punctures. And doctors started to promote their ser services and gradually they were replacing babka's. Uh, and this elimination of uh, uh, services by midwives, that's what we called medicalization of maternity, usually in the uh, scholarly literature, it's establishing male control over female bodies. Uh, but uh, in the case of uh, late Russian empire and in the case of Soviet Union, it was more complicated and more ambiguous. And the goal of doctors was not to deprive women of their uh, choices. And actually, medical professionals provided women with more tools to make their reproductive choices, and not all of them were male doctors. In the Russian Empire, uh, abortion was punishable by uh, deprivation of civil rights and exile to Siberia. And the law was especially harsh toward people who helped women if they had knowledge of medicine. So basically, for Babkas, it was not a, a big deal. Uh, doctors, and uh, I mostly talk about those belonging to liberal and radical cycles, they were the first to speak against the severe punishment. Uh, for them, uh, the law was a blind copy of Western legal codes, and it was from a scientific point of view, because uh, uh, they argued that the fetus was not a person. And the law um, and the large numbers of underground abortions with uh, high mortality, they were considered the ultimate example of Russia's backwardness, not Russia, but Russian Empire's backwardness. Uh, so the doctors, they uh, criticized the state and it was a part of the political struggle against autocracy. They wanted some uh, uh, big changes uh, and they, um, they, uh, they were fighting autocracy in the name of the people. So they invented abortion as a kind of like a political task uh, to be resolved by the intensive intervention from above. Uh, so it was not just the threat of prosecution that they could not perform abortions and earn money, uh, but because of their collective aspirations to be the power to change the state. And uh, it's also important to mention that the Russian Orthodox Church in the early 20th century was not interested uh, in, uh, in abortion. And it was just lawyers and doctors who were talking about it. And doctors put abortion at the center of public attention as social, not medical phenomenon. Uh, and doctors uh, usually described women seeking abortion as poor and educated under the double burden of exploitation. Uh, but what is important that they, uh, uh, they um, slipped fluidly into establishing a universal category of women as a whole. And doctors insisted that they are following the needs and interests of all women, both poor and rich. So abortion was a social phenomenon, but at the same time for uh, late imperial doctors, it was not limited uh, just for the poor woman. It was not limited, they never limited the procedure just to social reasons. The main example of the debate is uh, 1913 Congress of the Pirogo Society. It was the uh, society na named after the famous surgeon Nikolai uh, Ivanovich Pirogo, and it was the main uh, collective voice of doctors in the late Russian Empire. The Congress put abortion at the center of it, uh, its debates, and its final resolution stated that both a woman who had an abortion and the doctor who performed it shall never be criminally prosecuted. Uh, in the words of the main speaker and proponent of decriminalization, quote, 
A doctor's duty is to treat a patient and there should be no other power lost uh, beyond a doctor and a female patient that could prevent a doctor from fulfilling the duty. At the same time, doctors at the Congress openly said that uh, rich patients already had access to safe abortions. Again, making it clear that they don't want to uh, benefit financially from the, the criminalization, but to help the poor. They also proposed large scale uh, social changes, like introducing economic support for single mothers and generally improving uh, working class living conditions. Uh, in the words of one um, radical doctor, in the future, quote, uh, each woman as a free citizen who has equal rights with men shall not be turned into a reactive machine. And uh, for him, uh, criminal responsibility for abortion was a restriction of personal freedom. And these uh, statements are very radical for 1913 because we don't have, uh, uh, no one uh, at the time is a free citizen with equal rights. Uh, so in 1913, um, uh, a few doctors, and some of them were female doctors, uh, they made a case for abortion is explicitly political, not just social issue, and it was a part of the uh, uh, of the late uh, imperial struggle for political freedoms. But the way progressive doctors portrayed women was uh, actually also quite ambiguous. So women uh, is both an equal uh, and free citizen, but at the same time, uh, women were uh, very often portrayed as victims of their social circumstances. They were backward because of, uh, because of the circumstances and also because of their biological nature. Um, and doctors usually described uh, women seeking abortion as young, inexperienced, searching for happy life, and with wine and dancing, they could be easily seduced into sexual affairs. Uh, and when they discovered their pregnancy, they were overcome by fear and despair, and they turned to babkas, ignoring dangers of the underground procedure. So basically, such uh, women do not look like they were conscious subjects of their reproductive choices. So it was the uh, key dilemma for doctors both in 1913 and also in the later Soviet period. So women were uh, conscious and free citizen equal to men, and they should have control over their reproduction. But at the same time, their consciousness, it's suznania, uh, was always impeded by social and economic conditions that uh, undermined the autonomy of their decisions. And there were also, of course, those who opposed any calls for decriminalization and argued for more policing in the interest of the state. Uh, these doctors, uh, they totally rejected the social origin of abortion. For them, it was a constant of human nature that arose from the complicated uh, circumstances of uh, individual lives and, that, uh, uh, and it could not be reduced to social factors. For conservatives, abortion was a matter uh, of individual choices but they rejected as women individual freedom to make such choices. Uh, such uh, conservative doctors were speaking on behalf of so-called nature, so the biological function of women to give birth, and the state, the state that was interested in population growth. Um, Lenin wrote an article about abortion uh, as a reaction to 1913 Congress. Uh, for him, contraceptives and abortion reflected the position of the bourgeois, who cared only about individual interests. Uh, nonetheless, Lenin criticized the law against abortion as a part of the hypocrisy of the ruling class. Uh, and uh, uh, in his words, uh, such laws against abortion uh, should be unconditionally annulled and they were against uh, the elementary democratic rights of male and female citizens. Uh, but even if Lenin referred to individual rights, his views on the abortion laws were dictated by the interests of the working class. And for Lenin, abortion was a part of the larger social question. Uh, so for him, there was no need uh, to focus attention on the peculiarities of women's condition and abortion. And this uncertainty uh, uh, was the reason why after 1917, there was no immediate change to the abortion law. Uh, Lenin in general and other Bolshevik leaders were in general suspicious to the idea that women had the uh, right to abortion. But since there were doctors who, were, uh, who made a very persuasive case about the social nature of abortion and they promoted it a lot, 
uh, so Lenin and other uh, Bolshevik leaders, they just could not ignore it. Uh, and uh, the decree on the protection of women's health uh, issued in November 1920, it was presented as a uh, reflection of women's needs and interests, and ultimately as an expression of women's collective political will to become workers and citizens. Uh, and this will, of course, inevitably led to regulating their reproduction. Uh, so the decree made, was made possible by the collective power of doctors who had championed it before 1917, but after and after 17, when doctors became the creators of Soviet public health care, uh, this uh, decree was made possible. In the decree, abortion was seen through the social lens. It was a result of capitalist exploitation, but the decree uh, went much further by not limiting abortion to social considerations. Abortions were fully legalized and were to be performed free of charge. It was no more a private individual matter, but something universally uh, accessible to all Soviet women. Uh, there were still limitations, and uh, the first one being that abortions were to be performed only by doctors. So even licensed and uh, uh, midwives and babkas, they would be prosecuted. Uh, the second limitation required that abortions were to be performed only on the premises of uh, means uh, nationalized uh, uh, under the control of Commissariat of Public Health. Uh, but the Commissariat had no control over private doctors, obliged them to perform abortions for free. Uh, so uh, actually the uh, 20s and 30s uh, showed that the uh, free abortion was an unrealistic goal uh, and uh, the decriminalization just created a, a striving market of private abortion services for which women had to pay. In the decree, uh, abortion was defined as a temporary evil, uh, it's a quote. Uh, but many doctors, uh, both supporters and opponents of decriminalization, uh, phenomenon. Uh, and in the 20s, uh, abortion numbers were rising, and there was no indication that they would decline anytime soon, because there was also no efficient contraceptives. And even the entry on abortion in the Soviet uh, medical encyclopedia which an official um, uh, book. So it proclaimed uh, that, quote, um, the desire of women to take a more active part in public life inevitably leads to aspirations to limit reproduction. So abortion was a part of uh, modern Soviet life and women's desire to rationalize and control their reproduction was fully justified. Uh, and now I jump to the uh, early 30s. Uh, at the time, uh, dozens and dozens of instructions were issued by the Commissariat of Public Health that aimed to regulate abortions. So first of all, they were about the price women had to pay for, uh, for abortion. So there were still uh, women who could get it for the procedure for free because of their low income, but others had to pay. And also there were uh, many, many instructions that specified certain medical conditions that made the abortion justified from a medical point of view, and in this way, uh, uh, but the, the flow of instructions uh, uh, often contrasting each other, uh, they show that these issues were never settled uh, because doctors as an assault on their professional autonomy. But the fee was a very important change. Abortion in the early 30s uh, was turned into an operation that women had to fully cover. It was a departure from the 1920 decree in which abortion was meant to be supported uh, by the state, similarly to childbearing. Therefore, it was female, uh, a part of female emancipation, but it was not anymore. And the parallel process to criminalize private practice and uh, establish control over all medical uh, practitioners, uh, over all doctors, as uh, one prosecutor on an abortion trial in uh, 1930, um, the goal was to build, uh, uh, quote, uh, to build public Soviet health. So we are in Stalin's 30s. 
forge uh, the new figure of a doctor who served the state. Uh, and in fact, it was nothing new because earlier the uh, creators of Soviet public health care, they rejected this liberal position that abortion was the private decided uh, to be decided by a doctor and a woman. Uh, they rejected this earlier girls of um, pre-1917 doctors who wanted to have uh, the abortion uh, procedure full with no intervention from the state. In the, uh, in the 30s, the uh, obligation to document and report all abortion procedures mean that uh, expert knowledge and diagnosis were no longer part of uh, patients' private relationship with their doctors. And the growing number of required statistical reports uh, show the desire to control doctors. Uh, so the Stalinist abortion ban uh, was first about uh, uh, first of all about control over doctors because in this way uh, they could, the state could control women's access to abortions. And the decree of uh, 1936, uh, the uh, uh, decree on the prohibition of abortion, class struggle and uh, capitalist uh, exploitation now uh, guaranteed that it would provide all necessary political and economic conditions for all women to enjoy motherhood. Biological reproduction was now an obligation. It was a uh, and citing Lenin who opposed uh, eminal, uh, criminal responsibility for abortion, uh, the law demonstrated the historical difference between 1920 and 1936. And by claiming that female emancipation had been achieved, the only country in the world to do so. Uh, and of course, if the biological reproduction was an obligation, it implied control and punishment. And women were punished by uh, so-called public condemnation. Uh, and more importantly, they were, uh, uh, if the, for repeated offenses, they had to pay a fine and a very, very significant fine. Uh, the criminal prosecution for doctors uh, uh, for illegal two years in prison and uh, a most severe punishment if performed in anti-sanitary conditions. Uh, the law still uh, only allowed abortion for medical consideration and only then for a fee and uh, earlier abortions were free of charge because like any other medical procedure in a public hospital, uh, medically justified abortions were part of free public health care. But now the fee signaled that such abortions were still suspected to be abortions uh, and women had to pay again quite a lot for them. So the abortion ban turned uh, uh, abortion into a procedure accessible through money, personal connections and high status. So again, ironically, abortion continued to be a matter of class. Like in the uh, uh, like the pre-Soviet and early Soviet doctors uh, uh, argued, providing punishment for abortion, uh, the Soviet leaders silently oh. admitted that even if abortion uh, was a, diminished the fact that women sought abortions for very different reasons that often did not reflect their economic status. And the law is usually explained by Soviet leaders' demographic concerns, especially as a result of a uh, famine of uh, 1933 that killed uh, Ukrainians who were considered class enemies. Uh, but I doubt that uh, for Stalin, the vanishing of millions of uh, class enemies was a demographic problem. Basically, uh, it was a desired outcome. And the law, uh, in effect, uh, we can see it as a result of, of the famine, because earlier reproduction of class enemies was, uh, of course, undesirable. And now, if there are no class enemies, they are all dead. Uh, all women, uh, all women should reproduce. Uh, and also, in my view, the, the Soviet abortion ban did not roll back the achievements of female emancipation. The main of, uh, obligation of women was still to work. Uh, not reproduce, and they had to combine, um, and they had to combine the two, and not just be mothers. And uh, reading many anti-abortion brochures and legal documents, uh, I still see that despite um, many changes and contradiction, uh, officially um, 
uh, in the Soviet Union, uh, the, uh, the official documents, at least, they never rejected the basic uh, idea that women uh, uh, should have control over their. And the promise uh, of the Soviet state to make, uh, to make uh, women equal to men in political and social uh, terms was still the basis uh, for a law allowing women to seek um, abortions uh, um, when uh, it was illegal. And for example, um, I, uh, I turned to such uh, uh, cases as like personal requests to authorities. And uh, uh, a couple of such, uh, I found a couple of such requests in the archive and women, they uh, used exactly this language, the official language uh, um, for in their requests. So my question was whether it was possible uh, to preserve the legacy of uh, 1920 decree within the uh, Stalinist centralized health care. Uh, so enormous efforts to turn abortion into a, a matter of political loyalty to the state. At the same time, uh, many sources, uh, uh, like first of all textbooks, but also official instructions, um, they show uh, on the opposite effort, the effort to preserve the autonomy of the profession. Uh, and the high numbers of underground abortions uh, after the ban uh, could be regarded as resistance from uh, both uh, women and doctors to the law. Uh, before 1920, there was no indication prosecuted for illegal abortions. It was only midwives. At the same time, uh, about the, uh, and the same was uh, about the period after uh, 1936, in the late 30s and 40s, uh, the numbers of doctors prosecuted for illegal abortions uh, was rising. Uh, but as the reports and instructions indicate, doctors were still performing illegal abortions. And the only way to change the situation uh, uh, was to involve external fo force. Uh, so like uh, to involve more and more criminal investigators and prosecutors and basically make them uh, uh, permanent staff uh, in a hospital. So that was uh, seen as the only way to uh, establish control over what was happening inside hospitals. But it was never successful and never really worked. And doctors of all levels wanted to preserve their autonomy and they presented this as an essential feature of their profession controlled by outside authorities. Uh, so here, finally, turn to Nina. Uh, in 1951, uh, Nina Holopotyuk came to uh, the small town of Irshawa uh, in Transcarpathia. Uh, they didn't have a hospital before the Soviets started uh, building one in the late 40s. Uh, before uh, that, uh, uh, in uh, 1946, Transcarpathia was officially incorporated into Soviet Ukraine and uh, public health service was one of the main proclaimed uh, values and aims of citization. And the uh, towns and villages described as backwards were to catch up with the Soviet regime of hygiene, sanitation, and medical services. Um, so by the time Transcarpathia was uh, incorporated into the Soviet state, um, the goal of female equality had been proclaimed as already achieved 10 years ago. But Transcarpathia was a backward post-capitalist region. That's uh, here I use as official terms. And according to uh, the official narrative of Sovietization, it was just the beginning of female emancipation there. Um, but uh, the problem how to uh, combine work, uh, uh, any like the official uh, narrative never mentioned any difficulties with combining work and motherhood, even in this post-capitalist region. Um, but the doctors who were coming there still remember the period when abortion was not a crime, but a tool of emancipation. Uh, according to Nina, she had to treat uh, many women with uh, post-abortion complications, or, 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 but it's, uh, this term is quite unclear because it could mean both long-term complications or the immediate ones that had to be uh, investigated. And uh, right before she came to Irshawa, there were um, uh, new or there was a new order. Basically, uh, uh, doctor's main duty was not to treat a patient, it was not to treat a woman uh, with a miscarriage, but to uh, uh, to treat her as a suspect, to interrogate her, and to make an investigation. Um, 
but in the memoir, uh, Nina uh, never used these terms like underground and illegal abortions. And it appeared she asked no questions, simply treating her patients without the mandatory interrogation. And the, uh, what's uh, especially telling that the archive has no pa paperwork on questioning patients with suspicious miscarriages mis uh, and uh, post-abortion complications. Although all other hospital uh, correspondence with the prosecutor is preserved and early, orderly from that time. Uh, and officially since uh, 1951, uh, Nina worked in an abortion commission. Uh, but when she described abortion that she performed, uh, her wording clearly suggested that there was no commission or any involvement of other doctors, uh, because commission, it means like three doctors. Um, and Nina was not the only one who provided abortion services. Uh, so, uh, Nina wrote about Babkas, whom at first the women trusted more, and she wrote about her colleague, uh, who was not uh, an obstetrician gynecologist, uh, he was an important political figure uh, in the town because he, he had been uh, head of the hospital uh, when she, before she arrived. And this doctor, he ran a somewhat unofficial but well-known private practice. He owned uh, a gynecological chair and instruments and he provided services for affluent clients. Uh, such services, among them abortions, were conveniently never spotted by the authorities, in particular since the husbands of most of his clients were supposed to be punishing people like him. So the Soviet authorities tolerated such services. Um, and the official statistics is also a useful source for understanding abortion during Stalinism. Um, the word secret uh, appeared in any annual report on uh, obstetrical help uh, that included abortion numbers yet they were hardly hiding the accuracy. The numbers in reports from Transcarpathia provided little information about how many pregnancy terminations were actually performed, where and by whom. And the annual reports changed almost every year, experimenting with ways to calculate uh, the numbers of, uh, of abortions. Um, uh, before 1953, there were only total numbers and abortions and miscarriages together Provide, uh, without providing separate numbers for each category. And the numbers of abortions performed outside of the hospital were closer to 90% of the total numbers of abortions. Only the remaining 10% were criminal, uh, criminal ones. Yes, there, uh, yet there was no mention of anything done about it. And the number of criminal charges did not specify whether it was a woman or a doctor who was charged. So the ministry could hardly evaluate the efficiency of its abortion surveillance. So the discrepancy between uh, how abor uh, fighting abortion was envisioned and how it was conducted demonstrates an accepted level uh, of professional autonomy and more importantly, uh, a lack of general consensus on abortions. And now um, uh, I'm jumping to uh, 1953, the death of Stalin. It just made possible uh, certain legal changes, um, uh, but it was not a turning point. It just made possible to channel the developments on the ground into the official state policy. And uh, what I see in, uh, in Kyiv archives and in, uh, in um, archives of the hospital, uh, allow me to say that it was, it was not a top-down decision. Uh, there was a pressure from doctors who continued to perform abortions and to discuss abortions both privately and on this uh, big official meetings uh, and congresses of uh, obstetrician gynecologists and also in textbooks and brochures. So uh, mm, um, my argument is that these doctors, they were the driving forces uh, behind the repeal of the abortion ban. And this uh, the law um, published uh, in November 1955. So. Um, 35 years after the first decriminalization, it provided women with, quote, the opportunity to decide for themselves the question of motherhood. So basically, the law uh, legalized abortion on demand, uh, uh, and the uh, Soviet Union was the first country that legalized abortion on demand. Uh, and in, even in one brochure of the same year, uh, one famous doctor wrote that abortion was a right of Soviet women. Uh, and using this term instead of opportunity. Uh, and actually it meant a lot that this term was used. Uh, but abortion was not a right uh, from my point of view. First uh, of all, because women had to pay for the procedure within the free and universal Soviet uh, healthcare. 
and the price for the procedure was quite high. For example, for a nurse in the Shawa Hospital, uh, it was 10% of her monthly salary, but for uh, like a in the hospital, it was a quarter of their salary. And peasants had to pay twice more than uh, urban women, so for them it was uh, absolutely uh, unjustified amount of money, uh, and they couldn't afford this procedure. Uh, so behind the emancipatory rhetoric, the law uh, epitomized the earlier tendency of turning abortion into a private matter and private service. Uh, the fee signaled that it had nothing to do with the goal of free uh, Soviet universal health care, and doctors were no longer in serving uh, all Soviet women or the state. They were just selling abortion services, and women had to pay quite a lot for it, either officially or as a bribe. And the, because of this uh, high fee, the law uh, created the situation in which a market of abortion services in the hospital thrived, because those who could not afford it, uh, uh, couldn't afford to pay the, uh, uh, the official fee, they uh, could pay the, a bribe, which was usually, I guess, a small, small one. Um, the, doctor, the, the law still kept the uh, same punishment for doctors for illegal abortions, but I haven't encountered any cases uh, or any numbers of prosecuted doctors in reports. Nina uh, never mentioned this law, and, uh, but after the uh, law changed and uh, her work would not be labeled as criminal, uh, more stories and details about performing abortion in, in uh, the hospital appeared in her memoir. Um, Writing about the late 50s, uh, Nina openly talked about the um, number of abortions she performed every day, it was 10, 12 every day, and how unofficial these services were, and how these numbers were different from the official statistics. And I have no doubt that, uh, that the law itself did not matter to Nina, and uh, the way she talked about abortion was always the same. Uh, in her narrative, uh, the cases of abortion were not collected to the official fight against it, and she never took uh, part in this official uh, fight against abortion. Uh, and, um, and it's uh, both according to the memoir and to the archive. Um, also, in uh, uh, one of my chapters, uh, I um, turn to, uh, I look at the financial documents uh, of the hospital together with the memoir, uh, to show how doctors really uh, gained the greatest advantage from these changes. Uh, and uh, uh, Nina described uh, her fellow doctor uh, who was a party member and who was also very eager to perform abortion for, bri uh, for bribes. Um, and also Nina, it's a very uh, exciting episode. She was also accused of performing uh, uh, abortions for personal profit and the party was involved and it was a big case, but it was uh, quickly silenced and dismissed. And not because it was not true, but because she was uh, a very uh, powerful figure and the party was totally fine with what she did as a doctor, as far as she did not uh, criticize the party or any like, uh, for example, the uh, what was happening in Hungary in uh, 1956. Um, but I guess, yeah, I have no time to talk about all this and you will find it uh, in my book. Um, uh, so uh, uh, just a couple of uh, final things. Um, yeah, I think, um, I hope that uh, my book uh, will be um, useful for understanding this uh, about professional autonomy, common good uh, versus individual interest and uh, how women were portrayed through their uh, reproductive ch uh, choices. Uh, and as I uh, watched this videos from the March for Life uh, last Friday here, um, I couldn't stop thinking about the uh, two wars, uh, uh, the war in Ukraine and the war for reproductive uh, freedom here. Uh, and I would say that in the, both of these wars, uh, Russia is our common enemy uh, because uh, for quite a long time Russia have been uh, actively engaged in uh, promoting political divisions in the US and Russia weaponized social media for political mobilization in the interest of Russia and in the interest of those uh, politicians who support Russia. 
And of course, I don't want to say that everything, uh, all this, uh, mm, uh, the, the American abortion politics is all about the Russian uh, interference. Of course, it's not. Uh, but I'm sure that Russia will continue to uh, use social media and all other ways to, to deepen this abortion divides in American society. So as a final thing I want to say, let's do what we can Ukraine and here in the, in the US. Thank you. This Great, thank you so much for fascinating work that you're doing. Um, I think we're great. what we're gonna do right now is I'm gonna ask a couple of questions to start us off. Uh, we don't have too much time, but um, if you do have a question, you can um, indicate that in the, in the chat function and then we will uh, get to you hopefully. And uh, so I just wanted to start out, you, at the end, you, you mentioned a sort of comparison with what's happening in the U US. And so I was thinking as you were talking that you, you talk about the, uh, the abortion issue as it developed in the Soviet Union um, over the period from say 1920 to 1936, or even into the 1953, um, as being one of sort of doctors on the one hand and the, the state on the other hand. Um, but one element obviously that's been instrumental in the case of the United States and in, in Western Europe, which is where I'm most familiar, is, uh, is women themselves organizing, right? So I'm wondering what, if you see a role played by women as in especially I'm thinking in 1920 when I in 1920 when I know there was a very active sort of like feminist element to the Soviet to um, to the Bolshevik revolution um, can you talk a little bit about women's activism as women I know there were women doctors do you see gender playing a role in terms of their the, the position that they take with regard to abortion because of their status, their gendered status? Um, yes, um, thank you so much for this question. Uh, so first of all, I think it uh, matters that actually in the Soviet Union, uh, uh, even before the Soviet Union, there were, uh, and it's a contrast with Western Europe, there were quite a lot of uh, women doctors before the revolution. And after that, there, um, there were many of them. Uh, and, uh, and they were one of the most uh, critical of, of the law and they were uh, arguing for the criminalization. But uh, I would say that it's interesting that uh, abortion was not a, uh, an important topic for uh, early Soviet feminists. So for example, Krupskaya and Kolontai, they were, were never, uh, abortion was never a, a part of their struggle. So ne they never argued that they uh, I mean, they, they never, um, uh, so it's not that they were uh, against the decriminalization, but it just was not a part of their struggle. And there, uh, and after abortion was decriminalized in the twenties, um, it was not something uh, uh, for women also, you know, uh, to be, uh, it was not a part of any uh, feminist agenda as well. Mm -hmm. Because it was uh, already decriminalized. Uh, and uh, in, uh, and of course, during the Stalinism, uh, it was presented, the, the ban itself was presented as a women's will. So there were uh, like official letters of women published as if they're like demanding the abortion ban. Interesting. It's, it's very interesting because that's a very different yeah. narrative than we see in the, the US and in, in Europe. So <clears throat> another question I have is, um, I wanted you to talk a little bit more about you. You got to Ukraine at the very end of your talk, and it, could you talk a little bit more about how um, the story of uh, abortion, which has more continuity than than you would expect, given the big legislative changes, right? So, but how how does looking at Ukraine illuminate the story in specific ways, different from say if you had focused on Moscow or Leningrad or something like that? Um, so first of all, uh, I wanted to uh, to show how um, how powerful uh, women were. I mean, like uh, usually we uh, we look at the official. Uh, I mean, like usually historians look at the uh, who study abortions in the Soviet Union. They look at the 
numbers uh, and uh, uh, especially the numbers of women who died uh, uh, when abortion was illegal. Uh, and of course, this number uh, are just the top of the iceberg. I'm sure there were many more of them. Uh, but at the same time, we do not see any agency of these women. These women are just victims. And here I wanted to show that uh, how the um, uh, the doctors and uh, um, uh, by the time I write about Nina, it's mostly 80, 90% of doctors were women. Uh, and how these uh, doctors, uh, not uh, uh, how they were able to decide uh, uh, regarding abortion in, uh, in hospitals. Uh, and it's, I think, a very interesting contrast to what we see through the uh, archives of the ministry, where it's mostly men mm -hmm. uh, who uh, write all these instructions. But it, actually, it's even, of course, more complicated because uh, also part of my story that uh, in uh, uh, 1954, uh, the first uh, minister uh, of public health uh, was uh, a, a, woman was, a woman was appointed. So I think it's also important, like, uh, what... Uh, women could still achieve in the Soviet Union. So women were both on the state side, they were in the professional, the medical side, or of course the patients as yeah. well. So they were present throughout. So it's very, it's harder to sort of cast this as a gendered issue in some ways. Yes, and, ironically. It's, and it's especially interesting that Nina, she was a Soviet power. She, she, was a, she was not a member of the party, but she was still a very powerful figure. Uh, and at the same time, uh, uh, I have this uh, fascinating uh, uh, episode uh, that how, uh, when she describes uh, how she had abortion herself, so she was also a patient. So it was uh, uh, this like uh, feminization of profession, I think it's very important. And you cannot basically, when you just look uh, uh, at these numbers, you know, at, at the archive, uh, uh, you would never able to see like the, the whole story. What does this feminization mean? Yeah. So I had a question about your sources with regard to um, um, with regard to um, Nina in particular. So you say that you you rely a lot on her memoir, which sounds like it's fascinating, provides enormous amount of information. But that memoir, of course, was written as you say around I think it was around 1990 or so. Mm -hmm. So at the very end of the Soviet Union. Um, what are your thoughts about how you used that memoir? How do you think about the fact that this was written so many years later, reflecting on her life? She she knows she has an audience. She's writing for a public. Um, so she's presenting a certain version of herself. How did you take those kinds of consideration those kinds of issues into consideration when you use this source? Um, yeah, uh, it's something that I've been thinking a lot. Uh... Because actually, I I met Nina uh, uh, a few times uh, uh, before she died in uh, 2013, uh, and it's interesting that basically I couldn't really get anything uh, new from conversations with her because she was just repeating the same narrative she had in uh, her memoir. Uh, and of course, you're absolutely right that uh, it was uh, some kind of like. Uh, product of her reflections uh, on her uh, past, on her life in a very special moment uh, uh, when basically the whole Soviet Union was collapsing. So the whole, uh, all these ideas that uh, she uh, served, uh, all the, how she imagined her mission, it was now on the, on the uh, it was like all collapsing. So I think it's not, uh, 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 a coincidence that she wrote this memoir exactly at that moment. Um, and it's especially uh, important uh, when she writes about her abortion. So uh, at the beginning, she uh, talks about it uh, as a uh, uh, like uh, her decision, her experiment as a doctor. But then she uh, slips into like talking about God and how God punished women. And uh, so it's uh, yeah, it's something uh, some kind of um, important part. Uh, uh, but I still uh, consider. Uh, um, I use her memoir, you know, like as Soviet films. Mm -hmm. They are fiction, but mm -hmm. at the same time, it's a um, um, 
it's an important source of information. Yeah. Uh, so even if it's not totally, even if they don't depict, you know, like the true life, mm -hmm. but they, they have some truth uh, about Soviet life. Yeah. So you say, just following up a little bit on that, she, you talk about her it's sort of sometimes in contrast with her colleague, who was a man, I think, who was very political, who was in the party and who, who was very, and so in some ways she's a contrast with that. How does she present herself in relationship to the state, to the Soviet regime? Does she see herself? I couldn't get a good sense whether she sees herself as sort of operating somehow autonomously as you make that larger argument. Is she self-consciously doing that? Or at other times she seems to be very much comfortable with the idea of promoting the agenda of the state so can but she was never a member of the party so how do you what is her political kind of identity uh so i see her as the such a good soviet doctor that's the way she presented herself that her mission was always to serve the people and basically to serve the state and she was never ever in a conflict with, with uh, any uh with the party so her husband was the head of the hospital uh only politically loyal people the head of uh, such institutions uh and uh, she never uh, imagined herself as a kind of a dissident she was always uh, and it's I, uh, and in her memoir for example she writes how she cried when stalin died she never mentions any uh, uh she lived in uh, you know uh a few hundred uh, a few dozen miles from the hungarian border but she never mentions what happened uh, in hungary in uh, 1956 so um, we can see what kind of uh, what kind of political position uh, uh, she represents uh, so she was she was uh, always insisted that she was she was uh, loyal to the Soviet state, but at the same time uh, she presents all this like small conflicts uh, with Soviet authorities because she wanted to insist on the uh, on the autonomy of the profession. That like uh, no one uh, and she had a conflict with K with the KGB uh, one, and she uh, throughout this conflict she insisted that um, she's uh, uh, an excellent professional, and uh, that's uh, was the way. Uh, uh, what made her politically uh, uh, loyal because she, she's a good doctor so she's doing a uh, very important political work she's like and this, in case of abortion i think she that's the same way how she imagined herself that she's like uh, uh, embodying this uh, uh, the state promise to emancipate this woman mm -hmm. Interesting. If you have, if anyone has a question, please just put your hand up and we can call on you. We have a few more minutes left. I'm happy to keep asking questions. Um, is there a question? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so this is a question um, from Hilda Hugenbaum, who asks, who says, thank you for this timely presentation on abortion, which is an acute topic again in the US. Does Nina explain why she wrote this memoir? Why do you think she wrote her memoir? Um, Hilda, thank you so much for your question. Um, yes, she wrote this memoir because she considered uh, that she did something important. She uh, uh, she considered herself uh, as this kind of like iconic Soviet doctor. There were many films about Soviet doctors and I use those films uh, in my uh, dissertation. Um, and she considered herself as one of those iconic doctors who were like really heroes of Soviet life. So she wanted to, uh, uh, to you know, to tell her story because she uh, considered herself a very important uh, person who was like uh, for uh, for all women, for all her uh, patients. She um, and also because she wrote this. Um, Actually, she, uh, I, I don't think uh, she was ever interested in like publishing it or anything. She wrote it mostly for uh, for her family, but I'm sure that she would be happy uh, if she uh, had known that uh, I'm going to use it. I'm sure. Okay, so we have just have a couple more minutes, but I have to ask you as uh, maybe as a final question. So you started when you gave your remarks. You started by saying that um, you. You hadn't initially thought you were going to write about abortion, but what you were really interested in was Foucault. 
So how do you see <laughs> Foucault playing into this story, if at all, or, or did you have to throw him out the window for this? <laughs> <laughs> no, I never threw him out of the window, but uh, at the end, uh, I just, uh, um, um, yeah, maybe uh, I just realized that maybe uh, he's not as useful as <laughs> as I initially uh, thought. But it's just uh, it was an inspiration that uh, you look at the hospital. Uh, you know, you're not you're not just uh, looking at you know like uh, uh, political uh, like archives. You, I started to uh, I was uh, very excited when I first uh, started to work in the hospital archives. It's such an amazing source, uh, really incredible. So I'm grateful to Foucault that he pointed me <laughs> this way. The whole dispersion of power and, <laughs> and the various different power power centers. Okay, so um, I guess that my um, my last question would be to ask you, We don't. do we have any more in the queue? No. No, okay. So my last question then, because I think we have to wrap it up, is to um, ask you whether you think it would be accurate to sort of summarize what you're arguing here as that as um that there this is a story of both autonomy on the, the the consistent autonomy on the part of the medical profession from the period from the pre-revolutionary period all the way through into the 1950s and that in general this is a story not of of breaks which you would think if you just looked at the legislature 1920 1936 1955, but rather one of, of, it's generally the same story. It just takes place in, under very different political circumstances. Would that, would you say that's true or do you think that's that's overplaying it? Uh, yeah, I think that's true, but uh, just there was uh, an intention to have this autonomy. It was not always possible, but there was a persistent desire to have this autonomy. And abortion uh, was, first of all, a matter of this autonomy in the, I mean, unlike, uh, for example, here in the in the US and in different ways of politicizing abortion, but uh, abortion, uh, like doctors talk uh, about abortion for uh, like 100 years, uh, seeing it as, first of all, a matter of their professional autonomy. So the state had nothing to do about abortions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the state comes to play a major role, yes. but there's still that, that mm -hmm. idea of doctors wanting to play a role, autonomous role in providing abortions is consistent throughout. Yeah, the absolutely. So uh, the state played role in 1913, and they, uh, but they actually wanted to play a bigger role. So they they wanted to kick out the state of uh, their relations with patients, and that was the same throughout the Soviet history. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, I think we're up, we're out of time here. This has been a, a fascinating discussion, and um, it's really I, I learned a lot. And I thank everyone who's attended, and thank you, Katya, for your work. Thank you so much for, uh, for uh, being here.